It's funny how it records sometimes and not, Nancy. I know. So it just said it was recordings in progress, but we're still in the practice session. Well, I just hit the record button. Oh, that's why. Because I don't want it. But I did a practice with uh, Lisa a couple days ago and James there, and it automatically turned on as soon as I went into the meeting. Weird. Yeah, I'm the recording part doesn't make sense to me, like when it starts. I know it's just, yeah. I mean, you and I could sit down and do like five back to back and try doing different things and seeing, you know, when does the recording actually start? <laughs> and I bet it would leave us still at a miss. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll try to do more research into that. Yeah, it's it's not a big deal in a sense. It's just funny with the little glitches with yeah platforms. Yeah, it would be nice to know definitively though. Oh, for sure, right? minutes to show time, everyone. Hey, Brent, I'm just checking out the discounts on Mahmood. I, I signed up and I mean, there's some things that are discounted up to 50% off. Oh, wow. So it's, 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 a, um, very, it's a variety of. It's, it's a bit of a variety, but definitely the ones I'm looking at right now, all the ones I'm looking at right now are 50% off. I don't know if it's a pretty big, um, pretty big website. Yeah, they got a lot of stuff when you start looking at it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess you can just say, you know, discounts, you may get discounts up to 50% off if you want to, like, I might do this. There's some good deals. <laughs> <laughs> we got some pretty good gear. Yeah.
Making it to showtime. My screen shared nicely. Looks good. Sorry, I was muted. No, that's fine. Thank you. One minute. All right, everyone, we're going to go live. We're going live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the eighth presentation of Outwatch Canada's 2021 and 22 webinar series. If I didn't know any better, that video there looks like it got filmed this year with all that pow they've been slaying out there. It looks pretty awesome. My name is Brett Strand. I'm your producer for the night again, and uh, we're going to have Nancy Geismar also online. She's going to be putting things in the chat box with some resource links and such. And uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. You know, we hope you're enjoying these webinars. We're having a lot of fun doing them. We seem to get a really good turnout every year, or pardon me, every week that we host them. Um, it's been quite surprising, actually. But, you know, it helps us work hard to get the messages out that we want. And we want you all to know more, go farther, and come home every day. First, we'd really like to acknowledge that our sessions are being hosted in the territory of the Four Nations, the Cynics, the Shequipment, the Tanaha, and the Silks. As a national organization, we also acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit nations whose land we live on and recreate on. I'm not sure if uh, apparently my webcam's not on, um, but it uh, looks like it is on my end. So maybe we got a little bit of a technical glitch there, but it sounds like you folks can see me or pardon me, hear me. Um, we'd really like to thank our sponsors. Um, as a nonprofit organization, we're super thankful for our sponsors for being loyal in their financial support for us during these challenging economic times. Um, they help us get these programs out to backcountry users such as yourself. Um, we have a lot of sponsors to thank. Tonight's main sponsors for this webinar are the Meteorology Services of Canada. Um, they create the mountain weather forecast we're going to be talking about tonight. And we're deeply grateful for this weather product that is updated daily, 365 days a year. Mammoot, the second sponsor, has been a sponsor since our inception in 2004. And we're super thrilled with their ongoing commitment to avalanche safety. And they're so committed 
that you'll notice in your registration confirmation and your reminders that you get for this Zoom meeting tonight, that Mahmood is giving all you attendees a discount code for their Mahmood products. The link's going in the chat box right now. And you know what? Uh, we took a look earlier and there's like up to 50% off on some of their products on this. So without due, we really appreciate any support for the programs that you're watching, the programs that you participate in, the bulletins, you know, every little donation helps. Uh, you can donate to Avalanche Canada, just go to the chat box, hit the link. You know, any amount of money is really appreciated. A few housekeeping notes, all you folks are muted automatically. You don't have access to a video cam. Um, we would like you guys, if you wanna ask a verbal question and have a good interaction with the presenter, you can raise your hand, I'll unmute you. You can ask your question and have that banter and then uh, we'll mute you back up. Uh, otherwise, type them in the Q&A box for all those questions. It's easier for us to track them there. You know, we really appreciate that. I know the chat box, we're really utilizing that for resources with web links and stuff along that lines. If you put your questions in there, they tend to just tick the tape up too fast and uh, we can't keep track of them. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. Tonight's presentation, getting the most out of the mountain weather forecast. The mountain weather forecast is a powerful tool that can be used by both the seasoned weather watchers and those who are new to weather forecasts and information. Lisa Irvin is an operational meteorologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada and the lead for the Mountain Weather Forecast Program. She's gonna share tips on how to best utilize the various aspects of the Mountain Weather Forecast so you can optimally plan your days out in the backcountry. With that being said, Lisa's presentation is moderated by our senior forecaster, James Floyer. He's gonna be answering some of the questions live and in the Q&A box. So with this high power duo, you know, let's get some good questions to them, you know, because they're going to be able to assist you with your weather and snowpack related questions all evening here. So uh, fill up that Q&A box and I'm going to pass it on to Lisa and James. So I uh, hope you folks enjoy the presentation. Great. Thanks for that introduction, Brent. Hello, James and Nancy. And good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Irvin, and I'm an operational meteorologist with Environment and Climate Change Canada. Just give me a moment here while I share my screen. Uh, Brent, you might have to shop, uh, stop sharing yours. Sorry, right, Lisa, there you go. Looks good. Looks good. Okay, excellent. So yeah, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm stoked to see that so many people have shown up to talk about the weather. It's certainly one of my favorite subjects, and it's not just because I do it for a living, but because the weather plays such a crucial role in a successful day out in the mountains. Now I've been forecasting for Western Canada for over a decade now. And tonight I'm here to talk to you about how to get the most out of the mountain weather forecast and other weather tools for your backcountry needs. Now, when I'm not at my desk, I'm in the mountains. I love ski touring and mountaineering during the winter. And I'm really curious to see who we've got in the audience tonight. So Brent's gonna get a couple of polls started. Uh, you should see a box pop up on your screen. Uh, first question I think is, uh, what is your main wintertime activity? There you go. You should see a, a poll box up there. And uh, yeah, if, if, you're, uh, if your activity of choice isn't there, uh, feel free to type it in the chat box. All right, results are in. Okay, so most of you are skiers and boarders, about 78% of you tuning in. <laughs> and we've got uh, some sledders tonight, some snowshoers, and of course, some ice climbers. Now we're gonna do a second poll right off the bat, uh, just to get an idea of your level of avalanche training. So Brent's gonna put something back up on the screen. And yeah, we're just really curious to know um, if you mostly get your training from online courses and, and webinars like this, or perhaps you've done an AST2 course. So I'll give you a, a 30 seconds or so to submit your answer there. All 
Okay, so we've got, uh, yeah, a wide spread in the audience, a few, uh, few new people to uh, mountain weather and mountain sports. Uh, we've got a huge percentage of people who've taken their AST1 and, uh, and then gone on further to take their AST2. And, and then we've also got uh, some folks who have taken some of the more professional courses through the CAA. So great, thanks so much for answering the, those polls for us. Now, no matter what your wintertime sport is, we are all at the mercy of the weather elements when we're outside. And a successful day is not just about understanding the forecast for your area, but making sure to look at all the relevant variables, precipitation, temperature, cloud, wind, as any one of these elements can end up turning you around. So here's our journey for tonight. Um, I'm gonna start off with a bit of history on how the mountain weather forecast came to be, what information you should expect to find and how to use it. Then I'll get into some major winter weather patterns to watch out for the, the season, not only when you're reading through the blog, but also if you're um, an avalanche professional doing your own analysis, there's some really key weather patterns that dictate you know, what you're in for in the mountains. I've then got a great list of tools to explore. And then lastly, I hope to really pull this all together and walk you through how I would use the mountain weather forecast and some of these other tools to prepare for a day in the back country. So first up at Environment and Climate Change Canada, we've been providing mountain weather guidance uh, dating back to the 1960s. Now over most of those decades, we've mainly shared the information with snow and avalanche professionals. But since the mid 2010s, we've revamped the product entirely uh, into its current blog style format that you see here on the left. And now the product is accessible to both professionals and recreationalists. So the text, uh, the animations, the graphics are all created by meteorologists at Environment and Climate Change Canada. And then we post this information to Avalanche Canada's website. We also work daily with Avalanche Canada's forecasters uh, to help sort out the nuances of storm systems as they pass through Western Canada um, so that they have all the information they need in order to create the public avalanche bulletins. It's been a really great partnership and one that's gonna continue for many years. Okay, so here we go. Um, but before I dive into the, the product, uh, yeah, I wanna get one more poll out of the way. And uh, so Brent's gonna pop that back up on the screen. And this time the question is, do you read, do you currently read the mountain weather forecast? And if so, how often? Now, don't be shy if you've never seen this product before, that's totally okay. You're gonna learn a lot tonight. <laughs> or if you're a frequent reader, I've, I've definitely got some more technical tidbits. Uh, so yeah, something in the presentation for everyone. Okay, results are in. And again, yeah, we have a wide spread. So um, we've got some people who have never heard of this product before. Great, you're gonna learn a lot. Uh, then, uh, uh, you know, a, a good percentage of people who read it a few times per season. And then over 50% uh, use it before most or every backcountry trip. And uh, yeah, 13% of you using it every day. So that's pretty wicked. So glad this information is getting out to you. Okay, so if you haven't already checked out the mountain weather forecast, here's where you find it. So avalanche.ca slash weather. And when you go to the website, you'll be defaulted to a page that looks something like this, where you get the date of the, of the blog, when it was issued, who it was created by, and then some sort of catchy or descriptive title to, to help tease you into reading more. Uh, then you've got a series of tabs across the top, um, each one with their own sort of written and uh, section with graphics. And when you first load the page, you're going to be defaulted to the synopsis. And we do this for a reason. So even as a weather forecaster, I want to start by first getting a handle on the big picture and then eventually funneling my way down to the finer and finer details. So yeah, first up with the synopsis, this is where we get to to try to describe the big picture weather story. So we're gonna be talking about um, major weather features moving across the province. That could be a big low pressure system or a big ridge of high pressure. We might talk about how unusual the weather is, if it's applicable, flow direction, or in other words, the wind pattern. We might also talk about if we're into sort of a persistent stormy pattern or heading towards some sort of 
major shift. So definitely if you're reading through the synopsis and you see um, significant or major shift on the way, that should be getting your spidey senses going in that, you know, there's a, there's a big change coming. And not only is that, how is that going to impact the weather when I'm out in the mountains, but how is it going to impact the snowpack? So overall, with the synopsis, we're just trying to tell you that big picture weather story. Now, as you scroll down the page, you'll come to this 500 millibar animation. And I'm just going to blow it up so it's a little bit easier for us to see. Now, we provide the animation at uh, this level in the atmosphere because it provides us with a lot of really great information. So at 500 millibars, that's about 5,000 meters above the Earth's surface. And at this height, the winds tend to blow parallel to these black geopotential height lines. So I like to think of these black lines as, uh, you know, the, the traffic lanes. Uh, so you've got the wind blowing parallel to these lines. And so right from this image, I can tell that we've got uh, strong southwesterly winds hitting Vancouver Island and uh, the Bella Coola area. So that's really great. Uh, the other things that you'll find on this graphic, well, there's the gray scale that gives you the cloud cover, and you'll see the legend here on the, on the left. And then you've got the colored shaded areas, which give you the 12 hour precipitation. Then the fourth component is these dashed lines. And those are the 500 to 1000 millibar thickness lines. And essentially they have a strong correlation to temperature. When you have really low values of thickness, you're likely to be in, a, in an Arctic air mass. And when you have very high values of thickness, you're gonna be in a more mild air mass with quite high freezing levels. And then in between, you know, you're sitting somewhere in the seasonal range. And just to note that uh, this animation is direct model output from our Canadian global model. So the forecaster hasn't actually touched this product at all. It's just automatically uploaded. Now, as you scroll further down the synopsis page, um, and I don't have a, a pop-up to show you, but uh, there's essentially a block of text below the 500 millibar animation that it's a little bit more of a technical discussion and it will describe what you're seeing in the animation, uh, for instance, in this case, it'll talk about this giant uh, upper level trough hanging out over the Eastern Pacific and then what that means for the weather across Western Canada. Now, if we flip to the day one and day two tabs, uh, both tabs follow the same format. So first you'll see uh, a graphic and I've blown it up here in the bottom right. Um, and that provides uh, a meteorologist drawn surface graphic uh, for the weather and where the low pressure systems are and the fronts and all that. Um, and the first graphic is for 4 a.m. Pacific time. And then there's a block of text below that to not only describe the graphic, but what's coming in terms of weather sort of over the next 12 hour period. Then as you scroll further down the page, you'll come to yet a second graphic, this time for uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time. And then once again, another block of text. Something unique to point out about um, this graphic on the mountain weather forecast is, you know, when you when you Google various weather products on the internet, there I mean there's thousands of them, but most of them are just direct model output. And you know, there's been some graphic designers to make things look really uh, really sleek uh, and visually stunning. But yeah, most of those products are just simply direct model output and haven't had any sort of meteorologist. Um, tweak or adjust things. So the mountain weather forecast actually uh, provides uh, one of the few opportunities to view graphics that are actually created by meteorologists. So we've done all the hard work and we've gone on to label where the lows and the highs are and draw in the correct position of where these fronts are, um, as well as provide some annotations to describe what's happening. Now in the text itself, uh, this is where we, we get into the details on day one and day two. Again, we'll refer to those fronts or those low pressure systems and talk about, you know, how much precipitation is coming, the wind, freezing levels, and cloud cover. Now, again, this year, we've broken the text up into three sections. So you've got a block of text for BC, uh, White Pass, which is um, a, a section that straddles uh, the Yukon-BC border, and then also for the Alberta Rockies. Moving on to the day three, four tab. So this is now moving out into that medium range forecast period. So at the very top, and I've blown it up here at bottom right, um, it starts off with a surface animation. Again, direct model output from our Canadian global model. 
And then in the text uh, paragraphs below, um, because we're moving further out in time, the text is going to include a sort of a medium amount of detail. Um, we'll, refer, we'll refer to the surface features, you know, those lows and those highs, what they're doing in terms of the weather, um, yeah, all the associated weather, but we're going to talk about things in a little bit more general terms, and that's just because we're moving further out into the forecast period. Um, if our Canadian model uh, appears to be a bit, bit of an outlier compared to other uh, models around the world, we may even include a sentence on the model uncertainty and how that might impact the forecast that you see. And then last but not least, there's the day five to seven tab. So for anyone who has just come back in from the mountains and is sitting down at their desk on a Monday, already daydreaming about, you know, where you're going to ski or, or sled or ice climb the next weekend, well, this is a tab for you. So it provides a discussion of the upcoming Friday, Saturday, Sunday period, sort of, and, and into the early uh, hours of Monday. Now this product is created once a week. Uh, we create the content uh, on Monday mornings and then upload it to Monday's blog in the afternoon. We then um, recycle the same content on Tuesday's blog just to give it a little bit of a longer shelf life. But it is the same information no matter if you look at this on Monday afternoon or any time during the day on Tuesday. Now, when you scroll further down on the page, you'll also see a number of, uh, of graphics. Um, there's some automated products that show up no matter what day of the week it is. So those will still be available. Um, yeah, any day of the week or the weekend. It's just this text portion that's only available on Mondays and Tuesdays. Now, yeah, so this is, this is kind of the perfect product for the weekend warriors out there. And again, we're moving even further out in time. Um, so we're going to talk mainly about the big picture trends. Are things getting warmer, colder, wetter or drier? We might just discuss again the flow, you know, are we in a persistent southwest or northerly and how that impacts the forecast. Uh, we might discuss model uncertainty because again we're moving further out in time so, um, you know, models do tend to diverge the further out you go. And uh, last but not least, when we can, we'll include some educational tidbits and may even add in uh, some additional graphics to really help tell the weather story. So there you have it. That is what the Mountain Weather Forecast product is like. Before I dive into the next section, um, I'm just going to pause for a second. And uh, James, are there any questions from the chat box on the Mountain Weather Forecast that uh, maybe we should get out of the way right now? Yeah, Lisa, I do not see any questions, but folks, uh, if you do have anything that uh, you want to ask, uh, please feel free to drop it in the Q&A box there, and uh, we'll do our best either to answer it directly or pass it on to, to Lisa here as a question. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, don't be shy. Um, uh, I'll answer I'll answer just about any weather-related question. <laughs> so next up, um, I want to talk about a few common wintertime weather patterns and the weather that you should expect to see out of them. Uh, so yeah, these would be four patterns that uh, when you're reading through the blog, for instance, you should kind of keep in the back of your mind and, and see if they're showing up. Now I've ordered the next few slides in the same way. So um, you're going to see a satellite image on the top left to show you what that weather pattern actually looks like if you're looking at it on satellite. And then uh, the model graphics and uh, the forecaster created chart that you would see if you're uh, tuning into the blog. So this first weather pattern is uh, zonal flow, which is just the technical term um, of, of westerly flow, um, but really it all just comes down to being an active weather pattern. So what are some of the characteristics there? So, you know, we've generally got strong westerly winds, so that means wind blowing from the west to the east, and what that does is it tends to steer multiple weather systems at Western Canada, sometimes in fairly quick succession, like you see here on this weather chart. And uh, with that, you, you can end up getting uh, short breaks or, or really no break in between uh, the weather systems. Uh, during this kind of westerly flow, uh, the coast mountains definitely take the brunt of the precipitation. Uh, we tend to get that enhanced uh, uh, precipitation falling on the Western facing slopes. And then as these weather systems move further and further east, uh, the moisture is being wrung out each time and encounters a mountain range. So 
uh, the most amount of precipitation on the coast mountains, and then second most kind of through the Caribous, the Monashies, Selkirks, and then less or so for the Rockies. Now, a couple things to keep in mind. If uh, you're reading the blog and you see that, um, you know, the forecaster is referring to an active weather pattern, well, sometimes the models have trouble with timing these systems. So uh, oftentimes uh, the weather systems will actually come in quicker than what the models first um, estimate. And so if I am, you know, going to a product like Spot Weather to check out uh, precipitation for my destination of the day and I you know I, on the product I can see that we've got you know some flurries in the afternoon but the bulk of the snow is really coming in the overnight period well at least in the back of my mind if I know I'm in an active weather pattern then I'm going to build a little bit more buffer into my plans um, you know with the possibility that perhaps some of that heavier snowfall starts showing up a little bit earlier so yeah those are a couple things that I would keep in mind uh, during an active weather pattern. The second weather pattern I want to talk to you about is the Arctic outbreak. And we already had a pretty robust event uh, the, earlier this year. It kind of came as a somewhat nasty Christmas gift, uh, either showing up on Christmas Day or Boxing Day, depending on where you were in the pro province. So with an Arctic outbreak, um, as the name suggests, we're moving into really frigid temperatures on the satellite image, you'll see uh, clearing, uh, clear skies in behind the front and then sort of cloud uh, along the leading edge of it. And you can see it labeled here on the surface graphic. You tend to get northerly winds that move down through uh, the interior of BC and down the Rockies. We can get strong to extreme outflow winds uh, through our coastal fjords. And similarly, we can get strong to extreme easterly or northeasterly winds through gaps in the Rocky Mountains. Now, anytime you combine frigid temperatures with wind, you have to start worrying about uh, the risk of wind chill. Uh, so you really want to try to cover as much exposed skin as possible um, to prevent things like hypothermia and frostbite. The other thing to note is that because this front is coming down from the north, um, we tend to get these unusual precipitation events where we can get more precipitation showing up on the east side of, of the coast mountains as opposed to the west. And uh, similarly in the Rockies, this is sort of one of the major snowfall events for uh, the foothills and the eastern slopes is again this Arctic front coming down from the north. Now when you combine an Arctic front with an incoming low pressure system, these are the key ingredients for some sort of major snowfall event. Uh, yeah, so we, we saw lots of this actually over the last few weeks. Um, other, uh, in addition, uh, the Arctic air uh, reaching out to the coast is also the primer that we need for low elevation coastal snowfall events. The third weather pattern to talk about is atmospheric rivers. And we've heard a lot about atmospheric rivers this year. Um, you can see here on the water vapor image, it really is like a fire hose. So it's this plume of subtropical moisture, uh, usually originating in, in and around somewhere um, like Hawaii, and then taking aim at uh, the west coast of North America. Now, it's important to note that atmospheric rivers uh, have a variety of intensities. Uh, they can be quite weak or uh, moving quite quickly and end up actually having more beneficial results um, in that they help to fill, out, fill up our water reservoirs. Or on the other end of the scale, um, when they end up being stalled over one particular location for a long period of time, they can be quite destructive. And that's what we saw uh, back in mid-November. So with ARs, um, you're generally looking at moderate to heavy or, or very heavy precipitation amounts, mid to very high freezing levels, and uh, the strong southwesterly ridgetop winds. But two key elements are location and duration. The graphic I have up here on the slide is from an event back in 2019. Now, when this atmospheric river hit the West Coast, it was actually more focused on Washington and Northern Oregon. Um, ski resorts in those places recorded uh, lots of rain uh, to mountaintop really decimating their snowpack. Whereas here in BC, we ended up being more or less on the colder side of this storm. 
So on the North Shore Mountains, our freezing levels only got up to about 8, 800 to 1200 meters. Um, and then even in the interior, uh, over the Kootenays, uh, freezing levels only got up to about 1500 meters during this specific event. So um, for us, we, we ended up actually just getting a lot of heavy snow in the Alpine. But if you can imagine if this fire hose was instead pointed at uh, Bella Coola, well then all of a sudden Southern BC is in that really warm air mass. And that's the kind of event where our freezing levels really skyrocket. And we've seen some of those events already this year. Now the last weather, uh, weather pattern I wanna talk about would be upslope events. So what is an upslope event? Well, it's generally caused by a weather system approaching from somewhat of an unusual direction. They can either drift down from the Northwest Territories or perhaps even spin up in place over uh, Alberta, or they may drift across the Western states into Montana. Now around a low pressure system, you tend to get uh, counterclockwise rotations. The winds are, are doing something like this. And where you see the most uh, enhanced precipitation is in this wraparound wind where it's really pushing moisture now up the east side of uh, places like the Rockies or, or could be east, eastern slopes of the coast mountains as well. And uh, yeah, that's where you tend to see uh, significant snowfall in uh, more unusual places. If you're looking at the weather maps themselves, uh, to the northwest of the, the low pressure center is where you're going to find uh, that enhanced precipitation. Okay, so yeah, I'm just going to pause here once again uh, to see if we've uh, got any questions sitting in the chat box or else I'll just keep going on with the tools. Yes, we do have a question, Lisa. Paul asks, why does the GFS model always forecast more precipitation than Canadian models. He's talking about uh, weather model output, I guess. Um, and uh, can, you, can you give us a, a quick answer to that? Um, so, I, well, first off, I'm kind of curious whether, Paul, you're, you're always looking at one specific location. Um, so that, that could be part of the answer in that uh, certain weather models can end up working better uh, or worse for specific places. Um, but yeah, the performance of weather models on a day-to-day -day basis um, varies. Sometimes the GFS outperforms other foreign models and, um, and then other times it uh, does a much poorer job. Um, so yeah, without a, a few more details, I, I can't perhaps provide too much more to that answer, but um, just to say that weather models do vary in their performance. And uh, one of the, one of the best models in the world is actually the European model. Um, I really like to compare our Canadian output to the European output, um, but of course I'm also looking at the GFS to see uh, the range of precipitation values there too. Fantastic, I have one more question for you. Um, Sukhpreet uh, asks, what are the blue and red lines on the atmospheric fronts? Oh, sure. I will just back up. Um, you know what? And I'm going to go to one of my other examples. Yes. Okay. So uh, the the blue line with blue triangles represents a cold front. Uh, so when a cold front is passing over over an area, you can expect uh, freezing levels to be dropping, temperatures to be dropping, and the red line with red circles would be a warm front. So the opposite. So freezing levels rising and temperatures rising. That's all for now, Lisa, thank you. Excellent, great questions. Keep them coming. Okay, so um, I've gone through the mountain weather forecast and that is a really, really great tool to have in your toolkit, but it doesn't do absolutely everything. So we need to have some other products in our toolkit uh, to get our, our forecast for our day out in the mountains. So um, I'm gonna go through a bunch of different websites and then I've got an example coming up of how you can use some of those websites. So of course, um, I've already said, we've got uh, the mountain weather forecast, but um, similarly on this page, to the right-hand side of the mountain weather forecast is uh, a, a, a menu here where you can get, uh, or where you can access a bunch of different products 
There's real data in terms of radar and satellite imagery at all sorts of different zoom levels. So I highly recommend you check that out. And then there's also some options for checking out model data from our Canadian models. Uh, so we've got a wide variety of products there. Again, different zoom levels, depending on where you're recreating. Uh, really useful tool and helps, helps make the sort of the mountain weather forecast website kind of a one-stop shop for uh, both a meteorologist created product and then some direct model output. However, if you're looking for more tools for your toolkit, I've got a variety of websites and I think Nancy's gonna pop them in the chat, um, but feel free to hold your, your phone up to the screen and, and take a photo. Um, these websites are uh, publicly or freely available to the public. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to share them with you tonight. So starting at the top, if you're looking for a really good uh, website to go to for satellite imagery, I really like uh, this College of DuPage website. They've got a ton of different uh, satellite products visible infrared water vapor, all different zoom levels. Uh, they've, they've got different enhanced products. It really is a, a cool tool and is, is something that I actually use uh, every day when I'm forecasting in addition to a variety of other products. But yeah, kind of a one-stop shop for really great satellite imagery. Uh, for radar, so radar shows us where precipitation has been um, over the last few hours up until current time. And I've got a couple of websites there. You can, of course, uh, find the radar image on our Government of Canada website. Um, also, the University of Washington has a really good composite radar product. The only thing is it only covers the southern third of BC, so not very helpful if you're up in the North Rockies or Northwest. I will mention that if you're looking at um, a radar product uh, in your own toolkit that goes into the future, you're no longer looking at real data. So there's some radar products out there that blend uh, real data with model output. So if you're looking at a radar product and it is going out into the future, you are no longer looking at real data, you are looking at uh, some sort of model, model data that's been interpolated out in time. So just be aware of that. Next on the list there, I've got some websites for you to check out uh, current or recent weather observations. So off Avalanche Canada's website, uh, there's, there's uh, quite a few weather stations there to check out. You can also uh, look at webcams to view things like uh, cloud, cloud heights and uh, whether or not it's snowing or raining at uh, your trailhead. Um, and then there's sites like ARFI, which try to bring together uh, a lot of different weather information. So we've got weather stations from Parks Canada, Ministry of Transportation, Environment Canada, um, there's snow pillow gauges, webcams, it's, it's sort of all in one place. So yeah, have a, uh, have a look at what RFI has for you. And then lastly, I have uh, the, the ski reports or ski resort snow reports. So uh, this is snow data that's collected by trained professionals and gives you a really good idea of uh, what's fallen recently in your area uh, of concern. Next up, I've got a few different websites there uh, of forecasts that are actually created by meteorologists. So of course, there's our public forecasts on our Government of Canada website. Uh, the Weather Network also has uh, meteorologists that create um, forecasts for all across Canada. And then there's NAV Canada's websites where you can find a variety of products, again, created by meteorologists. And this is, of course, all in addition to uh, the mountain weather forecast that you see. And then lastly, and I have ordered the links purposely like this because um, as a meteorologist, this is how I would sort of uh, go through my weather workup, but it's also a really good habit for you to develop, to start with real data, forecasts that are actually created by meteorologists before diving into direct uh, weather model output. I know it can be really tempting and we're all short on time and, and all you wanna do is just go straight to that spot weather or, or windy forecast. But if you do that without having the context and that bigger picture, that's where you're gonna get surprised in the mountains. 
But when you when you do have that big picture already uh, in mind, then yeah, I've got a, a few different websites here, Spot Weather and Windy, probably two of the most popular ones out there for checking forecasts. Uh, but some other ones out there, Tropical Tidbits, Pivotal Weather, Meteorologics, and you can see the different countries um, or the weather models from what countries that are available on each of those different sources. Now, there's, there's a ton of different weather products. If you're completely new to weather forecasting, my advice would be to start with one of these websites, play around, find something that works for you, use it this season, and then uh, as you get more and more comfortable, start adding more products, more tools to your toolkit. Okay, so um, I'm sure there's you know a few questions maybe coming in about models and what websites are best, but I'm, I'm kind of wondering if maybe some of those answers, uh, I'll, I'll get to some of those answers as I go through my own example. Um, what do you think, James? Yep, that yep. Sounds, uh, sound, sounds good to me. Excellent, okay. So yeah, we've talked about uh, the mountain weather forecast and a bunch of different products. So how would I use this to get outside? I mean, it's Thursday evening and I've got the weekend off. So um, yeah, I wanna figure out uh, the weather for, for my planned destination. Now in forecasting, we refer to this concept called the forecast funnel. And it's just the technical term for essentially starting with the big picture, that big picture of what's going on in the weather and then working your way down the scale to the finer and finer details eventually trying to come up with that forecast for your specific destination. So that's what you see from the main uh, uh, sort of big inverted triangle. That's the, the true forecast funnel. Um, I've added on this, this extra step on top because before I get, get into uh, you know, what the future weather is going to bring, I want to know what has already happened. So what will I expect uh, to find when I show up at the trailhead? So, Essentially, I'm going to start by looking at some local weather observations, perhaps some webcams or snow reports. And then, yeah, once I get a handle on, on what's uh, recently happened, now I'm going to move ahead and, uh, and work on the forecast coming up. So starting with that big picture, maybe some big, big uh, satellite image, and then eventually zoom, zooming down, uh, reading the mountain weather forecast, and then eventually going to some sort of tool that's going to provide a point forecast for my destination. Now to help um, make sure that I'm looking up all the variables that I need to, um, I've got a notebook uh, that looks something like this to help prompt me in what information I need to find when I'm prepping for my day outside. So a couple of notes there on just, you know, the big picture, you know, it, is the weather forecast talking about any uncertainties that I should maybe just keep in the back of my mind. And then of course, all the relevant variables that I want to start filling in as I look at the, the different products. So to run through the example, I'm going to actually exit out of this presentation. And so for me, I, um, I, I live in the sea to sky, that's my backyard. And one of my favorite zones is uh, the Duffy Lake region. So uh, I'm gonna run through how I would come up with a forecast uh, for the Duffy Lake uh, for Saturday. Uh, looks, looks like a great day weather-wise. So on Avalanche Canada's map, um, not only do you get the public forecasts, um, but when you zoom in, you'll see that there's these black icons, which are weather stations. So I'm going to zoom in on, on uh, the Duffy Lake area. And I can see um, there's a couple of weather stations in my area that I would uh, go recreate in. So I'm actually going to click on these to kind of just get a gauge of, you know, has there been any new precipitation um, and what the temperatures have been like. So by clicking on uh, the black icon, you can get uh, a summary of weather observations. And I'm just gonna scroll down sort of through the last uh, 24, 48 hours uh, to see if we've had any new snow and it. And it does look like we've you know, had about uh, almost 10 centimeters uh, earlier today and another few centimeters late yesterday afternoon. And I know it's snow because the temperatures are all below zero, uh, so yeah snow overnight and then as we got into the afternoon hours today well temperatures did just crest above uh, the freezing level mark so got a little bit mild during the afternoon but not too bad 
Um, now I see there's some other uh, uh, weather stations in the area um, at different elevations. So I'm gonna actually zoom in and just take a quick look at what, uh, what they say as well. So I've got this blow down peak one and uh, at the elevation of about 1900 meters. And again, just kind of scrolling quickly through the last 24, 48 hours, I can see that we've had uh, three centimeters there. Oh, looks like, yeah, about 10, 12 at this site, uh, another few uh, the previous day. So yeah, we've, we've had, you know, over 10 centimeters. That's a, a nice refresh after uh, a bit of a warm, dry period there. And at this site, at a higher elevation, the temperatures actually stayed below freezing. So yeah, the snow is actually probably uh, fairly well preserved at this height. And then I can also see there's one more station up here that looks like it's on top of the, the ridge. And it's always good to get an idea of, uh, of what the winds have been doing. Um, now I'm just going to actually blow this one up so that I can fully see the wind data. And again, just kind of scrolling back through the last 24 hours, uh, I can see the direction. It's uh, written there, W for west, so that's a westerly wind moving from the west to the east. Um, so west and southwest winds predominantly for the last sort of 24 hours with that new snowfall. Um, and generally speeds of about 20 to 30. So enough, enough there for some wind transport for sure. Okay, so that just gives me a bit of a baseline. Um, now, pretty close to my area of recreation, uh, the nearest ski resort would be Whistler. So yeah, I always like to kind of Google, uh, you know, Whistler Snow Report to see what they actually um, uh, reported. And it looks like a little bit less snow in their area, only about seven centimeters. So, okay, you know, things are just being confirmed. The more I look at, it's just kind of confirming the picture for me, new snowfall um, and low enough temperatures for snow versus rain. Okay, so now I have an idea of what to expect when I arrive at the trailhead. Now I want to know, what is uh, what I've got in store for me for my day of recreation. So starting with that big picture, I've got this satellite loop running. This is a great example of the products you find on the College of DuPage, which is the link that I provided. Uh, different zoom levels you can see here on the left-hand side, lots of different products to explore. Uh, I've got an infrared product here with a little bit of color enhancement to show that high cloud. And so, yeah, I, I'm just gonna let the loop play and keeping in mind that my area of recreation is, is right here in Southwest BC. And you don't necessarily have to be a, an expert to uh, glean a few things from the satellite image. Really um, just at the very most basic is a weather system. So a big massive cloud headed towards me or away from me. In other words, is weather gonna get worse or is it gonna get better? So in my area in the Southwest here, um, it looks like there's sort of a tail end of whatever this system was. So perhaps a little bit of cloud cover still in the area, maybe a few flurries still falling. But for the most part, that system is headed away from me. Um, so in the short term, the weather is, is going to be improving uh, for my destination. But I can see this monster of a system sitting out over the Pacific. Now, from the satellite image, I can see it's more or less trying to make a beeline for Alaska and the Yukon. Um, but yeah, uh, there's definitely some cloud that's kind of curving around the coastline of BC. You know, is that going to hit me? Is it not? Well, these are the things I'm going to keep in mind so that when I'm reading through the mountain weather forecast, um, I can see whether or not a meteorologist thinks that weather system is coming for me or not. I also like to just take a quick look at the radar. Again, it kind of confirms what I've seen on the satellite imagery. Um, to see whether or not there's any precipitation marked by uh, the colored uh, blobs, essentially. Um, and, you know, are those blobs moving towards my area or away from it? And if they're moving away, then generally looking like the weather is uh, improving, becoming clearer. And yeah, there's a, there's a scale here on the product itself um, where sort of the, the lighter blue and um, green colors would be more light precipitation. And if you're getting into the yellows and reds, which you see here in Saskatchewan, uh, that would be more moderate to heavy precipitation. Okay, so that just gives me an idea of sort of the very short term forecast, but um, I want to read the mountain weather forecast to see, you know, what is actually happening. So I've loaded up today's blog and the title says snow today, then the warm up. Okay, already 
that's that seems like a big change snow and then a lot of warm air um and you know even this first sentence really says it we're flipping from one extreme to another so that's got my my uh, my spidey senses going um you know not only is that how that's going to have a huge impact on uh, the weather pattern but also on the snowpack so um, I'm going to definitely want to tune into uh, the public avalanche bulletin after I'm after I'm uh, gone through this weather portion here. So yeah, um, abnormally warm ridge of high pressure on the way, uh, and then yeah, continuing to scan through the blog. So the implications of this high, uh, this ridge of high pressure are the arrival of uh, temperature inversions above freezing layers and skyrocketing freezing levels. We're talking about 3,000 meters plus um, alpine temperatures of five to 10 degrees for uh, the Southwest, including my South Coast inland region. So I am in for a pretty toasty day if I'm headed out on Saturday. So, okay, so that's the big picture. Um, the satellite showed that big weather system, but it doesn't sound like it's headed towards me. And instead my uh, weather of concern is really this ridge of high pressure, warm temperatures, high freezing levels, and, and probably a bunch of sun too. Now, day one would be today. Day two would be tomorrow, Friday. Uh, but I'm recreating on Saturday, maybe Sunday too. So that's getting into the day three four forecast. So I'll go ahead and just click or skip ahead to the day three four tab. Um, now, yeah, I can. I've got the Canadian global output here that I can click through uh, to see if there's any cloud, any precipitation. Indeed, from this animation. I can see that uh, there's H's here for uh, high pressure. Uh, that is indeed in store for me for uh, not only my area, but it looks like pretty much all of uh, the southern half of BC. And that storm in the Pacific is, uh, yeah, it's just making us a, a beeline up, up towards White Pass in the Yukon. But again, I can go down to the text and read more about how this is going to impact me. So freezing levels peaking. Uh, between 3,000 and 3,500 meters this weekend. Uh, some pretty warm alpine temperatures. And for those in the southern interior and Alberta Rockies, it looks like um, you're going to have some issues with freezing levels and pretty warm alpine temperatures too. Okay, so that's my big picture. Um, a ridge, warm temperatures, high freezing levels, but what are those actual values? So now I'm going to go into a product that's going to give me a forecast for my specific destination. So Spot Weather, like I said, is a really popular website. Um, you know, you can scroll around on it, zoom in, and uh, yeah, you can zoom in right to uh, the mountain um, or trail that you'd like to explore on and drop a pin. So I've dropped one right on top of Mount Roar. It's a pretty popular ski destination here. Now, um, I really like choosing the high resolution model to look at first. It does the best job of resolving uh, the terrain in the area and mountains really have a huge impact on uh, temperature and precipitation forecasts. So I'm just gonna load up the high res model here. And I'm really on spot weather, I'm at least for the Canadian model, I'm mainly paying attention to the temperature, precipitation and, and cloud graphics. Now, the only thing with the high resolution model is that it only goes out so far in time. So I'm only really seeing the morning portion of Saturday um, in terms of temperature and precipitation and cloud cover. And that's just that's just how high resolution models are. They provide a lot of good detail, a lot of great resolution, but they only go so far out in time. At least from what I can see is that, uh, yeah, all of Friday and Saturday at least look dry up until the time frame that I can see. But I'm going to have to actually step back and choose one of the other models that goes a little bit further out in time. So you can see in this middle column here, uh, it actually labels how far out these models go. So if I click on the regional, which goes out three and a half days, that's going to definitely cover my time period of interest. Now, before I actually go through and read the data off the mediagrams, I want to make sure that I look first at the very top to see what the model elevation actually is. So models don't do a, 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 or can struggle with mountainous terrain in getting the elevation right. So even though I've dropped this pin on top of Mount Roar, which is uh, about 20, 2400 meters high, 
um, the model thinks that this point is actually at about 1600 meters. So just to keep that in mind. So looking at the, the daytime high temperature for Saturday at 1600 meters, I've got about two degrees as a daytime high. As I scroll down to the next graphic here, um, first you've got precipitation on the top and then cloud cover on the bottom. So there's zero precipitation showing up for Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, so dry forecast. And uh, yeah, the cloud cover uh, looks like there's gonna be a little bit of cloud around. Um, uh, I kind of wonder at what level that's gonna be, but yeah, generally looking at quite a sunny day. Now to get freezing level information, unfortunately it's not available on the Canadian products at the moment. Uh, so I'm actually going to scroll down and select the GFS. This not only gives me a chance to look at what the freezing level forecast is, but it gives me um, an opportunity to look at what a different model thinks in terms of precipitation and temperature. Again, I'm gonna check the model elevation up here. It's even worse, it's uh, about 1400 meters. Uh, so the daytime high for Saturday uh, is a little bit lower, uh, 0 0.4 degrees. And uh, yeah, scrolling down to the precipitation and cloud graphic here. Again, not much precipitation showing up, or sorry, no precipitation showing up on Saturday. And uh, yeah, a little bit of cloud cover, but uh, a good amount of sunshine. If I scroll all the way to the bottom, this is where I find information on the freezing level. Um, so you can see the height in meters on the y-axis here, and then the dates across the top. And on Saturday, there we go, freezing level, 3,000 meters. That is going to be a very toasty day. Now for, for estimating winds for my day of adventuring, um, I actually prefer to use windy.com. So I'm just going to move over to that product. Um, I find this this uh, this website to be quite user friendly. Uh, there's a bunch of different layers that you can uh, that you can put on to see where precipitation is, where cloud cover is, that sort of thing. Um, on the screen here, I've got uh, sea level pressure showing me that ridge of high pressure uh, dominating basically the southern half of British Columbia and, and uh, the Alberta Rockies as well. And, uh, and then precipitation, which you can see funneling straight up into the Northwest. Um, but again, yeah, this is a product where you can scroll in or scroll around, zoom in. Um, so I'm gonna zoom right into my area that I'm gonna recreate on. And again, I'm gonna drop a point right on top of Mount Roar and you'll see an arrow that, that uh, shows up. If I click on that, that will produce, um, again, a, sort of a different type of mediagram, but you know, more or less getting the same information. And uh, yet again, this just gives me another chance to check out what, uh, for instance, the European model is doing. Again, I'm gonna look for information on what height this model is actually referring to. And yeah, the European model is doing a much better job of resolving the terrain in this particular area. We've got an altitude of about 2,300 meters. So that's pretty darn close to um, my summit. And for daytime highs, it's predicting about five degrees. Okay, and that makes sense. We've got some pretty high freezing levels. I kind of expect to see temperatures getting up in that range. But yeah, across the bottom here, you can find uh, information on winds. Uh, the top wind uh, row is the sustained speed, and then wind gusts, um, usually color coded, is right below. Uh, so I tend to look at both values using the max or using the gust as sort of the maximum uh, wind speed that I would expect if I was standing up on an exposed ridge or summit. And then the arrows point in the direction that the wind is moving. So uh, kind of looks generally from the north or northeast, uh, pretty light winds. Uh, it's probably a bit small on your screen, but you know, generally in that sort of five to 15 or 10 to 20 kilometer per hour range. So there you have it. I've, I've looked at a few different weather products. I've got my notebook beside me and I'm basically inputting this information as I go along. So I'm just going to dive back into the presentation and uh, yeah, kind of sum that all up. So yeah, here are my weather notes after looking at uh, those few different websites. Uh, the synopsis, yeah, the big picture is we've got a ridge of high pressure, hot and dry, 
My uncertainty is, well, uh, you know, the temperature forecasts were a little bit up and down. So how hot is it actually going to get? And, you know, what's the impact? Uh, what impact is that going to have on the snowpack? And then, yeah, you can see I've sort of filled in the other parameters here. Um, yeah, sunny, hot day ahead. And of course, then that starts the rest of my process of, you know, what kind of clothing do I need, uh, water, food, and then of course, with this big change coming, I'm definitely reading uh, the public avalanche bulletin. Okay, so there you have it. We've covered a lot of things tonight. Thanks for staying with me. And uh, for anybody who's interested in uh, diving deeper into meteorology, I've got a few links there. Uh, there's the Avalanche Canada weather glossary. There's also um, the meteorological education website where you can sign in for a free account. There's probably about a hundred different weather modules on it, uh, ranging from very basic information to more advanced meteorology. And they're really, really well done. So I highly recommend that website if you want to dive deeper. And then of course, if you're looking for more of a classroom setting taught by professionals, there's uh, the Canadian Avalanche Association weather courses. And with that, yeah, I'll wrap things up here, pass the show back over to Brent and James and see if we've got some questions. Yeah, hi, Lisa. Um, we've had a few questions along the way. Um, if anyone has any more questions, um, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A. Um, just a, a little bit of a review. Someone was asking about freezing levels. Um, can you explain what we mean by freezing levels? Um, and um, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit of a comment about how the freezing levels are this weekend and, and maybe there's a little bit of something unusual with the freezing levels going on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Lots of great questions packed in there. Um, let me see, because I actually, uh, I had some websites pulled up here. Um, it's always nice to have a bit of a graphic to, uh, to talk off of. So bear with me one second. Maybe it'll work, maybe it doesn't. Ah, here we go. Okay. Uh, can you see that? Okay. Yes, it's looking good, Lisa. I can see that just fine. Excellent. Yeah, so these are really great questions. And uh, as I was alluding to on the last slide of my presentation, so there is a, uh, a weather glossary on Avalanche Canada's website where you can really dive into some of the definitions. Um, so yeah, I kind of like providing the, this, this one just so there's a bit of a graphic to talk off of. So during, um, you know, pretty standard atmospheric conditions, temperature tends to decrease with elevation. So if it's uh, 10 degrees at the surface or in town, um, as you go higher and higher up in the mountains, you're going to notice the temperatures are slowly declining to, to when you eventually reach zero degrees or the freezing level. So that's in, um, yeah, that's kind of your standard atmosphere. Generally, most of the time, temperatures decreasing with height. Now, this weekend, we've got some fairly interesting weather on the way. So we've got a very warm air mass that's, that's moving into the province or moving into BC and eventually Alberta. Um, it's coming up from the southwest, so it's, it's bringing this really warm air mass um, as this ridge of high pressure comes in. And on the coast, that warm air will show up at all elevations. So we'll have sort of hot temperatures, um, no matter if you're in town or on the mountains. But eventually, as you move well above mountaintop, you will eventually find that uh, freezing level, that zero degree isotherm, and then colder temperatures above. Now, what happens is when we've got these warm air masses moving into the province, our mountains can actually end up sort of stripping out the lower layers of that air mass. And um, we've got some fairly cool temperatures already sitting in the interior valley bottoms. And that cold air is dense. It, it tends to want to stay in the valley bottoms. So as this warm air mass comes into BC, it's riding up and over the coast mountains and then over that uh, cooler air settled in the valley bottoms. And in this kind of scenario, You've got warm, less dense air on top of cold, dense air. The two don't like to mix. 
And so instead, what you get is a temperature inversion. So instead of um, you know, starting out in the valley bottom and, and working your way up the mountain um, and having temperatures decrease, you actually have the reverse where you start in a cold valley bottom and the higher up you go in the mountains, the warmer it gets. And so that's sort of what's in store, especially as you head into the interior ranges this weekend. Yeah, that's fantastic. What a great explanation. Thanks, Lisa. Um, actually, there's a follow up question to that. Um, and that is, are there any particular weather patterns that can cause an inversion? And how might you spot this ahead of time um, and either in radars or weather models? Yeah, um, so temperature inversions uh, can form in a variety of ways. I've described one of the most common ones where you've already got a cold or an Arctic air mass in place and then you've got this, uh, this warm air mass coming up from the south or the southwest uh, that comes in across the tops of the mountains. So that's yeah, definitely one of the, the, the main causes of, <laughs> of the temperature inversion. Um, other times you can get temperature inversions forming from um, just a, a ridge of high pressure sitting over the province for multiple days in a row. And under, um, under that ridge, you get subsidence. So um, the atmosphere is trying to sink. And as it sinks, it compresses and warms. And so you can actually get warming in place. Um, and that would just be from a, a multi-day stagnant ridge of high pressure. Um, the third way is just advection of, uh, of warm air. Um, and advection is just a fancy word for uh, transport of warm air, perhaps from an incoming weather system. So a few different ways. Uh, and, and yeah, you'll see those patterns on the weather charts. Um, you'll read about it in the text of the mountain weather forecast. Yeah, the good news with the mountain weather forecast is that's exactly the kind of thing the meteorologists like to talk about. So, so usually those things are mentioned. So um, a lot of the heavy lifting gets done there for you. Uh, I, there's another question here about um, terminology when we're talking about wind directions and a little bit of confusion about when we're talking about something maybe moving towards the west or when we talk about a westerly. Can, can you help us uh, fully understand that? Yes. That is a great question. So I'm actually going to slide right back to just so we have a graphic to, to talk about. Let me blow this one up. Oops. Okay, so um, yeah, it's just a little bit easier when we have some visuals. So wind direction, the way that we have uh, the nomenclature, the, the, the way that we've come up with how to name the winds is the direction from which they blow. So where are they coming from, as opposed to naming them um, uh, in the direction that they're, they're moving to. And we do this because the source of that wind tells, them, tells us a lot about what's coming in the weather. So on this graphic, um, we've, and I'll explain why it's a southwest wind in a second, but um, we do have Southwesterly winds, remember the winds are blowing parallel to these black lines at this height in the atmosphere. So southwesterly winds uh, through Vancouver Island here. And because it's a southwest wind coming off the ocean, I know it's gonna be, uh, it's coming from the south, so it's probably gonna be mild and it's coming from the ocean, so it's probably going to be moist. So in terms of the weather forecast, I know my temperatures and my freezing levels are going up and I'm probably expecting precipitation. Alternatively, if I had a northern, northerly wind, that air is coming down from the north and it's, and it's going to be pulling in cold temperatures and probably a drier air mass too. So that's, that's why we've come up with this naming convention. When we say a westerly wind, it's coming from the west, it's coming off the ocean. If it's coming down from the north, it's a northerly wind bringing that cold, dry air. Hopefully that uh, sums things up. Yeah, that's great. And, and we sometimes talk about things moving um, to the east, for example, a low pressure system or a front or something like that. And I think sometimes there's a bit of confusion there, but um, always when we talk about the winds, it's where they come from, right? You got it. Fantastic. Um, so Seb um, asks, you mentioned that you 
wonder uh, what level the clouds are going to be when you saw some degree of cloud cover in, in that um, spot weather cloud cover trace. How might you estimate that? So I think he's talking about how might you estimate the level of the cloud? Yeah, and that's a really great question. Um, and one that I get asked quite a bit, actually. Um, there's certainly a lot of paid subscription products out there that give you a lot more detail on uh, cloud height and level. But in terms of uh, freely available products, um, there is, uh, there are, you can use webcams at ski resorts or highway passes to gauge some level of cloud. Some of the cameras actually kind of look up and include a portion of the sky so you can kind of see where that cloud layer is resting. Um, there are also, um, uh, we also launch weather balloons twice daily called Radiosons. Um, and again, I've got, I actually have one of those products up here um, that tell us a lot about where moisture is in the atmosphere. Um, so perhaps I'll throw this website in uh, the chat afterwards. But um, yeah, so we launched radio balloons, which is just a giant balloon with some instrumentation attached to it that measures things like pressure, uh, wind, temperature, and moisture. And it goes straight up so we can see a vertical profile. So if I click on um, the profile here for Vernon, this would give me real data and actually tell me where exactly in the atmosphere um, this cloud layer is. Oh, whoops, <laughs> wrong one. We'll see if it loads. <laughs> there we go. So yeah, this is a weather balloon that's been launched from Vernon. It's, it's really the only balloon we have for the Southern interior, unfortunately, but um, when the temperature line, which is this rightmost line, is very close to the dew point temperature line, which is the leftmost line, uh, this is essentially the elevation that I would be expecting to observe cloud. And on the left-hand side, it might be a little bit too small on your screen, but if you were to go check out this product yourself, you'd see uh, numbers that mark the elevation on there. And yeah, again, by just kind of looking over to the left-hand uh, axis, you can see the height of uh, this cloud. And this would be real data. Um, other, other places that you can look for uh, information on cloud height would be uh, some of the NAV Canada products. So TAFs and GFAs, um, they do require a little bit more uh, um, deciphering, but there are manuals out there to help you understand uh, TAFs and GFAs. But but those are forecasts that are created by meteorologists that provide uh, information on cloud height uh, in specific areas. Um, can you think of any other products there, James, for cloud height? The only other short term product I can think of is a product called the GFA, which is an aviation product. Um, it's quite technical and it definitely needs some learning. But if you sort of have a, an interest in sort of more techie products, then um, uh, it could be a, a, a good way to spend a couple of evenings uh, having a look at that. Oh, actually, I did think of one more. Um, I almost forgot on Windy. So this was the product that I showed when I went through my little example. Across the bottom, there's a couple of different options for different types of visual products. And if you go to the airgram, um, now this is, a, you know, it's a little bit rough, but, and, and probably again, too small to see, see on your screen. Um, but when you go check out Wendy on your own time, um, there are some um, uh, elevations marked. It's just very small <laughs> on the left-hand side. And yeah, the gray shading you see here would be moisture or cloud masses. Uh, so for uh, the forecast for Thursday and Friday, I can see that there's a lot of low level and mid-level cloud. But as I get out into the Friday, Saturday, Sunday time period, um, yeah, there is some cloud coming in, but it does look to be on the higher end of like the higher higher elevations. So this at least gives you a little bit of some basic information. Is it low, middle, or high? Right on. Um, we have a, another question that asks, any tips on estimating what altitude on the trail you're likely to start finding snow? Um, 
perhaps satellite imagery or etc i guess uh satellite imagery probably is going to run into problems that it it's uh, not going to be updated um at least the kind of satellite imagery that you need to see that kind of information um yeah that's a that's a really great question i would almost say your best that your your best source of information will be things like um Facebook groups, social media, in, like, you know, Instagram, um, comments that people put on websites like um, uh, the different, like the different hiking websites. Those, those are going to be the places where you can not only search for that information, but you can actually ask the question, hey, I'm headed here, you know, where can I expect to find snow? And of course, the webcams at ski areas, things like that. And if there's a nearby ski area, then you can get some sense of elevation um, from that if there's if there's a view of, of, of the webcam. Um, we've just got a couple more questions. Um, is cloud height indicative to temperature inversion? I, I think um, they're trying to say is there some relation to cloud cover or you know the type of cloud you might see and in, in inversion conditions yeah really great question so um and it's almost kind of a chicken and egg story here because <laughs> uh, during inversions during these stagnant ridges of high pressure they tend to trap moisture at the surface which kind of builds up over time um, and can create that uh, valley cloud um, and the valley cloud does in fact mark um, the elevation of uh, um, the inversion itself. So yeah, um, best used for low cloud, doesn't necessarily work for an incoming weather system. Mm -hmm. Right on. And then uh, Taylor asks, what kind of weather indicators are you looking for that raise red flags? Um, I guess we can interpret that in many different ways, uh, either in real data or in a medium term forecast. Okay. Um, red flags. I guess it depends on what my concern is. Um, am I concerned about freezing rain on the roads? Am I concerned about heavy snowfall? Am I concerned about a warm up? Like it really depends on the situation. Um, Maybe we should focus on avalanches. <laughs> <laughs> on avalanches. Well, I mean, you might be better at answering that question, but I think any major change is one of the red flags. And uh, yeah, as the mountain weather forecast title even suggested, snow and then a big warm up. Well, those are two completely different things. So. Um, just the title in that blog is raising a red flag for me. But yeah, do you want to maybe take that one, James? I, I, I really like your answer of major change. Um, and I think we could see major changes in the amount of precipitation. So a lot of new snow and wind, typically anything over 20 centimeters um, starts to raise some flags there and wind speeds over about 25 kilometers an hour where you are, the, the, that's a good flag. Um, and then changes to temperature or solar radiation, such as we're seeing or expecting to see this weekend. And, and Lisa's done a great job of showing us that. And then, um, and then I guess we mentioned uh, wind already. So, um, you know, wind as well. So I, I, think, I think the answer of any, any rapid change Snowpack doesn't like change and tends to respond accordingly to that. I, I, I think we might have got through them, Elisa, and um, some, some really great questions. Um, and, uh, you know, our time is good. We're a little bit over time, but I think that speaks to the level of engagement here. So, um, um, yeah, if, if you have a, a few final words to say, that's great. Sure, yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you all tonight. And uh, yeah, I really hope you tune in to the mountain weather forecast. Uh, we've got a lot of really hardworking meteorologists trying to provide content uh, for BC and the Alberta Rockies and then all the way up into White Pass. So uh, definitely check it out and, uh, and yeah, enjoy your season, be safe. Thanks very much. Uh, be safe this weekend uh, with the warm temperatures. Uh, we're gonna pass back to Brent to wrap up today's session.
Thank you, James and Lisa. That was amazing. Weather. Um, I've taken numerous weather courses, technical courses, and the more you look at it, the more you want to know. It's uh, ever lifetime of learning, I find, with weather, for me anyways. Um, fantastic. Um, weather. Um, with that being said, let's all think about weather. Um, one little blurb. I'm going to plug uh, our forecasts. Uh, there is a special public avalanche warning presenting to us this weekend. Um, so folks, get to our website, avalanche.ca, check the forecast, check the conditions, read that spa, make sure you understand what's going on there. And it didn't really get cold in here. I just kind of put a toque on because this is going to be our giveaway today. We get a toque and one of these Avcan buffs. We got four people that are going to win those. Uh, Nancy's going to draw some people's names and then you're going to send your shipping information to producer at avalanche.ca which she'll drop in the chat box as well so i'm going to get nancy on here and she's going to draw a prize for a toque and a buff and there's going to be four different draws we've got like multiple styles of toques we've got different colors all different kinds of stuff going on here and i've got some names pulled out of the hat and it is these, there's four, going to Amanda Wang, Eric Stanger, John Verhagen, and Tristan Pinsano Marot. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. So Amanda Wang, Eric Stanger, John Verhagen, Tristan Pinsano Marot. Please email producer at avalanche.ca and we'll send you a toque and a buff. Thank you. Awesome, thank you very much, Nancy. So that's our uh, that's our show for tonight. Um, if you did not win a toque, the beauty is, hey, you can go to the Avcan store, you can purchase a toque. We've got tons available. Go to the store, check it out. Thanks everyone for attending tonight. We really thank you for joining us. We do appreciate your interest in Avalanche safety. You know, you can support these programs as well by donating as little as $10. You know, there's a link in the chat box. Hit that up. Next webinar, two weeks from now, Tuesday, February 3rd, choosing terrain for snowmobilers. We got Martina Halick. She's our lead, lead, uh, pardon me, lead member of the North Rockies field team. She's going to come on there and she's going to lead you through some fun train exercises, talk about train, and see if we can sleuth out some good travel habits. So pre registration is required. We hope to see you folks uh, at the next webinar. Thank you very much for your time this evening.